and his investments range from biotech companies to electric cars and rockets. He does not only look at profitability. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I hope that got your attention. He does not only look for profitability, but also seeks meaningful impact to human society and a vision for the future. He is also, pas he is also passionate about amateur or experimental rocketry. We invite him to share his perspectives of the future. Please welcome Mr. Steve Jurvetson. Hello, can you hear me? You guys got to, okay, good. Wow, that hurt. I am really sorry. <laughs> well, let me, um, I mean, how can you follow that panel of NASA administrators? I and mean, I just want to spend the rest, rest of the afternoon with them. But anyway, I'm on. And I'll try to share some of the enthusiasm we have in the private sector, investing in startups that are going to space, they're launching uh, rockets, launching satellites, and trying to change the world from the private sector side. Um, I work as a venture capitalist, as you may have heard before going deaf. And we invest in a lot of different things. Most recently, um, we've taken quite a keen interest in space. Um, in fact, if I give you a quick overview of what I hope to cover, I want to share some of the enthusiasm we have for this category. And fortunately, I can say that this year. I've been going to space investing conferences now for uh, about 10 years. And this is the first year in which I've seen just an array of opportunities, like six or seven this week alone, that are truly exciting and I think very venture fundable. And I couldn't have said that in any prior year. So I think something definitely has changed. That clock's not running, by the way. Um, but before I get to my usual topics, which have to do with entrepreneurship, accelerating change, and uh, hopefully points that will be relevant to anybody with an innovation or entrepreneurial bent, um, I want to start with a personal story, um, how I got interested in this. And uh, I've never done this before, and I might never do it again, um, because it can be kind of embarrassing. This is me as a young teen, well, actually just preteen. And I grew up in Texas. And I went to a space camp at JSC, right? So I didn't go to band camp, but I went to space camp. And it was very uh, influential on me. Um, it turns out, I didn't know it at the time, but the guy there that was with me, I learned this 30 years later, 30 years later, just last year at NASA Ames, was Richard Garriott. He you know, went on to do Ultima. And the only reason I knew he was the same, because I knew him as Lord British, was that he had the same silver necklace that he had ever since he was an 11 year old, that he wore still to this day. Um, and then that's how I made the connection. And it was just an amazing connection to the current day. But you know, these childhood influences have a big impact. You've heard from Tom Atchison this morning, and you'll hear some more from him on how sort of STEM education and kids can be inspired with rocketry and with space. I just want to share my personal story. Um, when my son turned three, we just discovered rocketry in the local hardware store local, excuse me, hobby store, they, when they still had those. And uh, we started launching more and more rockets, and it turns out, I don't know if you know this, there have been, oh, we're getting a little bit of feedback, 500 million uh, rocket launches in America alone. 500 million, right? And um, of course, the Bay Area boasts the largest rocketry club in the world, but they lost their last site. It was out of Livermore, it finally got shut down after yet another run-in with the fire department. And uh, there's no order to launch rockets anywhere in the Bay Area legally. You can, you can pop them off illegally, of course, everyone does. But there was no sanctioned place. So I actually emailed Pete Warden. And I want to thank him. He got back to me same day and managed to get through the bureaucracy in record time. And we now launch regularly every month at NASA Ames. So there are rocket launches at NASA Ames every month, no matter what anyone might tell you. Uh, and this is a group uh, photo from one of those early ones. Now, this. Uh, Inspiration, of, I mentioned Tom Atchison. It, it sort of led me to realize there's more than just these Estes rockets. He's the first guy who opened my eye to that. If that clock could get going, that would be awesome. Oh, OK, that helps. Cool. So we started late. What do I just go uh, till you know, 10 after or something? OK, cool. Um, he said, you can go bigger. Right? And so uh, I, we went out to the desert, Black Rock Desert. So you have to get farther away from society. You can't do this at Ames. And the rockets we build now have multiple video cameras strapped onto them, multiple flight computers. So you can compare the flight dynamics to the computer simulations you run ahead of time. My son and I would design these things and just have a blast, which literally and figuratively. Ever since uh, he turned about five, we've been going out to the Black Rock Desert. This last summer, we broke Mach 2 four times with this carbon fiber airframe and had onboard streaming GPS so we could you know, not only find it again, but but uh, see how it performed, and you know, we, we found the limit. Mach 2.2, no problem. Mach 2.5, it completely shredded. Um, 
Then we went to some big rockets, right? The, the one on the far right, for a sense of scale, my son fully fits it inside. Um, but, of course, we never flew it with him inside there. And um, in the V2 design, unfortunately, I've learned those are really hard things to fly stably. Um, but they are big. It inspired a talk I gave at TED. If you want to Google the joy of rockets, you can get a sense of how exciting this can be. Uh, and the one on the bottom left, my son designed from scratch with a rocket at each fin tip, which is an incredibly difficult thing to pull off. At night, they're beautiful, especially when things go wrong. Uh, the one on the right is when I melted the forward aluminum closure on my motor, and luckily the upper stage performed exactly as it should. So the twirl you see on the left is the parachute and, um, uh, and blinking lights uh, coming back to the playa. Okay, I mentioned Tom Atchison. He started this group, Rocket Mavericks. Um, I just wanted to give you a visual to go along with the rocket that's sitting in that room over there, if you haven't seen it. It literally is that rocket, um, refurbished with a new nose and a bunch of students that he trained on the basics of rocket science, right? Because rocket science is tangible, right? There's, the visceral joy, right? And why, why do we see all these videos from like the early panel, right? Every space company has to show their launch videos. There's just something about seeing the launch that, that grabs your attention, right? And here, everything around flight dynamics, the, the computing part of it, if you're into computer science, if you're into mechanical engineering, if you're into physics, there's something for everyone in this. And uh, my son and I and the students that have had the, the luxury of working with Tom, you see him there on the top, um, uh, can truly attest to that. Um, in the desert, this is the prize. This is what everyone's trying to get to, you know, the, hit the flight waiver, 100,000 foot altitudes. See the thin blue line of the atmosphere? Uh, it's, it's just breathtaking. I first saw it on this uh, series of three photos on the left. A guy named Gene Novacek out of Mobile, um, excuse me, out of um, Missouri, uh, launched this up with x-ray sensors and incredible stuff. And on the right, this last summer, uh, a better camera uh, from a, um, another guy, Derek DeVille, that uh, the YouTube on that is just astounding. And it inspires a whole generation. We just heard about the phone set. Oh, I was there as they were testing it, um, um, again, with the Mavericks uh, airframe. You can see also there's a biosampling payload there to see you know, what lives in the upper troposphere, on the upper part of the atmosphere, and, uh, and then the, the balloon test that followed in the bottom right. And again, that rocket you see there uh, is visible in the next room. Now, that led to all kinds of interesting adventures. This has been over just a small sample over the last few years. Um, everything from the armadillo test flight to crawling all through Endeavor to take photos for the California Science Center um, to some pretty, well, actually interviewing Neil Armstrong, an amazing experience. Um, this one here, spending the night with SpaceX when the ISS uh, birthing occurred was truly remarkable. Um, it, it, when I saw the video today on the big screen, it literally brought a chair back to my eye because I saw myself in the audience cheering and remember what it was like there having just gone through three all-nighters in a row, two launch attempts, and then the successful uh, docking uh, or berthing, as they call it, um, all in the evening. And the employees were just going nuts. So this has been an amazing experience meeting some of these astronauts. I'm most recently working with the B612 Foundation a little bit, trying to help them. You'll hear from Ed Liu on uh, Saturday about that initiative to try to protect the Earth from asteroids and near-Earth ob near objects. But all this also led to some other peculiar interests. Let's see if I can go forward one. Which is spacing, a, uh, collecting Apollo artifacts. So um, in a partially self-interested way, but also to inspire another generation of entrepreneurs, we have all these on display in our office. Um, and I host tours with, with the local rocketry club and others to go through all kinds of things, interesting things, some of which have flown on missions like uh, that uh, optical site that was on the moon for three days in Apollo 16 or in the bottom right corner, the first Apollo fuel cell. You, you heard about fuel cell technology. That was literally serial number one. The first liquid oxygen hydrogen engine there in the middle and then uh, a derivative of the lunar module uh, descent engine. And that's all in our lobby, which is... It's easy to just put something there and seek forgiveness rather than permission from my partners. They just showed up and they're too heavy to move. So it's now become a space museum. <laughs> that also uh, inspired me to do what I think is the coolest artifact I've ever had a hand in, which is coming off the successful space mission um, with the, the ISS with SpaceX. I just really thought I needed to get a, a tribute from the generation of Apollo astronauts, many of which you know, may not be here 10 years from now to see this fully play out, some of whom um, whose health is not as good as others, but all of whom that I spoke to personally in soliciting this um, cared a lot about SpaceX and the next generation. Some of their messages about their excitement about future Mars missions and others uh, were truly touching. Um, the, uh, uh, every one of them composed that message from, from all, the, all the missions that now hangs in the SpaceX uh, central hall hallway. So enough about the fun prelude. This sort of maybe shows you some of my random walk through life, the interest I have, and the belief I have that rocketry and space can inspire a generation to study math and science. What do I do for a living is invest in startup companies. We're an early stage venture firm, primarily startups that are you know, a few people in a garage with a big dream, no product, no prototype. That's what we typically do, although we do some later stage investing as well. We have offices all around the world and about seven um, billion uh, under management, um, but again, partitioned into small pockets. 
So as I think about investing in space, I, I went back to a talk I gave at NASA Ames in 2002, all right? And um, the question I was speaking to is, you know, what are, you know, at the time, you know, what are the, like, what's a science project? What should be looking for a government grant or some kind of government partnership for its, you know, it, you know for its existence? And what really feels like a commercial a a enterprise? What feels like it's ready for business, that it's ready to be in a company? The interesting thing about the question in the, sli in the slide and, and the entire thing is this was a nanotech conference, right, at the time. It's nothing to do with space. But the framework is exactly the same. And the answer, the main answer, not a particularly sophisticated one, but one that I still hold to this day, is that sure, you want to change the world. You want to have that bold vision, the thing that attracts employees to work each day, that, that gets you up out of bed, that sort of star on the horizon that you're striving towards. But some near-term pragmatic path to get there. So in the nanotech world and molecular electronics, there are all kinds of frameworks in which you wouldn't want to just like hunker down for 10 years and hope you had the solution to everything on the other end. You'd want to iterate with customers. You'd want to have stepping stone products. And you'll see that in a number of the companies presenting here at this conference, that they've taken that sort of pragmatic step that like, I may want to do asteroid mining X number of years from now, but in the near term, what can I do to generate revenue, right? Um, so it's the combination of the two. That's really tough, by the way, to do. It's easy to say and very hard to do. I really respect the entrepreneurs that can figure out how to pull that off. The advantages, as you heard from the prior panelists, are you get fast feedback cycles from customers, not investors, because investors can steer you astray as soon as, I mean, as much as anyone. You get incremental risk reduction, right? So you don't have to try to raise a ton of money when you're the most risky. You can do it step by step. And interestingly, you can, th and you need to think about the timing, the sort of the components of your solution. So for example, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Think about the uh, conversion to electric vehicles. Um, or, or let's say getting off of oil for vehicles. Let's say you wanted to invest in that theme, and as clean tech investors, we certainly do. Um, how do we get beyond petroleum in vehicles? Right? So there was a whole investment wave around hydrogen. The problem with hydrogen was it needed fueling stations. And the sort of cat and mouse chicken and egg problem, I guess you could say, chicken and egg problem that we wrestled with is, you know, who's going to build the hydrogen stations if you don't have the cars, and who's going to build the cars if you don't have the stations? And so part of the answer was buses, and, you know, there's, a, there's an answer to that question, but it's not like, well, let's just do it, right? All consumers will just switch to hydrogen. And so we didn't actually invest in anything to do with fuel cells or hydrogen. It just seemed like it was stuck. And instead, something like a battery solution where you could charge at home, you don't have to think about charging station, the whole chicken and egg problem is solved. Make a car people might want, like a Tesla, that they don't need to worry about going anywhere else for infrastructure. In contrast now, think about a company like Project Better Place, where you want to build these battery swapping stations, evangelize that to automotive OEMs to design it in, and hope it all comes together, and it might. It takes about a billion dollars to answer that question, though. Can you change user behavior and have it all come together with partners? And, and I wish them well, and I hope it does, but we just don't have enough money to finance that kind of an endeavor. And similarly, when you think about it, if you're not a NASA budget, if you're not a government budget, you can't just, as a startup, as a venture capitalist, we can't think along those terms. We can't say someone gives you a billion dollars. That's just not one of the, the things that we write out in a business plan assumption. So we have to think about these incremental things. To just maybe that's a point of disclosure. As it applies to space, you know, it could, you know, I use that framework a bit when I think about fuel depots. You know, why would you want a lower fuel depot now? It's just like Project Better Place. It's, it's building a fueling station before there's a bit. Someone else has to have a business model that's going to thrive around what will I do with that fueling station? Is it deep space exploration? You know, where are we going? What's the plan? And, and we probably want to invest in that first before the fueling station. Now, let me again just say that's just us. Plenty of other venture firms have somehow found it perfectly reasonable and wise to invest in the fueling stations before there's cars. Um, but we'll see. So what are we interested in? Um, uh, we think the biggest opportunity that's maybe obvious, the elephant in the room, is that getting into low Earth orbit is getting cheaper. And it might become 10 times cheaper still. And if that happens, that opens a plethora of opportunities for startups. Right? So it's all the small sad opportunities that you hear about. What could you do? The, the, the sort of the epiphany that went on in so many entrepreneurs' minds is, OK, let me just assume there's been a, a sea change in the cost to get to orbit. What would you do differently? Would you build big, expensive, you know, robust, satellites that you know, stay up there for a long time and have station keeping and, and then the whole cost budget escalates or do you just go fast, cheap and easy, right? And let the things fall out of the sky more often and that makes it easy in the regulatory path and put up constellations instead of single satellites. So there have been many, many proposals we've seen to put up constellations of satellites, you know, hundreds, um, for communication or Earth observation pur uh, purposes. Um, uh, we've also invested in SpaceX, uh, as you might have heard, and, and of course that was you know, part of the investment thesis around low-cost access. Around um, uh, sort of clean tech themes, there's, it, it's interesting, and one of the other things we like is when there's a terrestrial application sometimes. It's not always the case, but sometimes 
their terrestrial applications for the technologies we invest in in the new space domain. And if you think about if humanity is ever going to become a spacefaring species, it's the ultimate recycling challenge, right? If you're going to go somewhere with humans on board, you know, reprocessing everything from energy to waste to water to fuel to food is going to be really essential. And how can you be more efficient? How can you harvest energy? How can you store it? So we have, I didn't list them, a whole bunch of battery investments, solar investments, things that, you know, like the best performing solar cell on the planet right now. Um, all those, in theory, would help these, but have near-term terrestrial application as well. You heard uh, about synthetic biology from Pete. Warden on this last panel, and, and Scott Hubbard before him, helped start some master biology work at NASA Ames, and uh, we're excited about that because obviously, you know, all the stuff that would apply on mission would apply on Earth today, right? And so we have, uh, you, Craig Venter was mentioned, uh, his company Synthetic Genomics, uh, and I'm, I'm on the board of that as well, and it's, you know, re-engineering microbes to do our bidding to make fuels, chemicals, food from waste carbon streams. And then also water purification, like Oasis doing forward osmosis, that would be pretty important on mission as well. So, let me think, let me check how I'm doing on time. Okay, so I'm gonna leave some time for questions. I'm gonna go a little more quickly through a section here, um, which is, we look for entrepreneurs, sure, with unique ideas. That's somewhat unique to our firm, by the way. Some other venture firms, we like, well, as long as it makes money, we should invest in it. We're more, we wanna invest in a company that's unlike anything we've ever seen, because we somehow believe that if six other companies have had the same idea at the same time, not only is it a horse race, but it's probably not that radical an idea, right? So whenever there's an idea someone has and it's obviously a good one and most people agree with it, we probably should not be investing in it because it won't change the world, right? The ideas that change the world at the time of their founding are generally regarded as bad ideas. And as proof of this, Google, eBay, Hotmail, Skype, we either invested in these or we're trying to invest in all of these. And so I know exactly what all the other venture capitalists were saying at the time and most thought they were stupid, right? Hotmail was turned out by 20 other VCs in a row linearly before finally someone said, okay, right? So one out of 21 thought it was a good idea, 20 thought it was dumb. Um, that's the mark of success. If a few people think your idea is brilliant and the majority of people think it's crazy, that's a, better than everyone agrees with you. Unless you're like in a big company and you're just doing a sustaining innovation. I'm only talking about disruptive innovations, the kinds of things that will make a mark in history books, the kinds of things that change the world. That's all I'm talking about, not all innovation. So it's this disruptive stuff. Okay, disruption, why is that so important? Well, if it weren't for disruption, startups wouldn't exist. Right? We wouldn't exist, they wouldn't exist. You know, stasis is the enemy of progress. Stasis lets big companies get bigger. They have money, they have brand, they have channel distribution power, they have everything going in their favor. There's no reason why in a stable industry, new entrants have a chance, right? And so some industries, oil and gas, chemicals, agriculture, they've been kind of stable for a while. It's all changing as we speak for reasons I'll get to. But in the past, those weren't be the natural places for entrepreneurship. And it sort of explains why VCs don't invest there, at least historically. Disruption can come from deregulation, privatization, financial collapse, new channels of distribution, things that happen from time to time. And perhaps low Earth acts, you know, the, the reduction in cost of low Earth, um, uh, low Earth orbit is one of those perhaps game-changing disruptions, right, if you're in the satellite business. Um, the internet is obviously one. You know, mobile phones, if you're in, in any kind of software or services business, similarly disruptive. But the one that we bet on year after year, decade after decade, the one you can count on in the year 2050 is Moore's Law and the ilk, the, the pace of accelerating technological change. That is the source of perpetual disruption that is the governor and dynamo of economic growth throughout centuries. And I said centuries. Um, and I think it's really important because most people don't realize that. So let me just explain what I mean. Uh, Gordon Moore, uh, went salmon fishing with him. He grew up here in um, Pescadero, I love salmon fishing out there. Uh, he also loves the microbes in the ocean. We'll get to that later. But generally speaking, he's you know, the eponymous Moore's Law. What did he actually say? In 1965, he had five data points. That was the bold part. And then he plotted a dotted line. Most people don't do that with only five data points on a log scale. And then have it hold true for 40 years. You know, that's kind of remarkable. Uh, in fact, I don't know if there's anything like it in technology business, right? Where quarter by quarter, people don't seem to know what's going on, much less 10 years, much less a decade or two. And this is the way Intel likes to look at it. Remember, straight lines on these things are exponential curves, right? For the non-science folks, right? Not a linear scale here. And it's not ending, you know, Intel sees more innovation coming in the next three years than the prior 10, but they're moving more to lathering memory onto the chip and architectural improvements like multi-core. It's not like, it's actually the, the way more Gordon Moore originally thought that it was gonna improve. But nevertheless, the trajectory's been improving. But this is kind of relevant. No one buys transistors, right? When was the last time anyone bought a transistor? And said, I need four, no, I need four million transistors. Now, you, you bought, compu well, maybe you're in the industry, but you probably bought, if you're a consumer, 
computation or storage. You said I need eight gigabytes of storage for my camera, or I need the following processing power in some metric. And maybe it was translated to transistors, unless you're an electrical engineer. You, you, if you're buying them by the millions or billions, you're probably not counting each transistor. You're, you're buying the capability. And so Ray Kurzweil plotted that. And it's pretty fascinating. Again, on the far right, exponential scale. So a straight line is an exponential. This is actually a double exponential, according to some uh, analysis. Each dot's the best price performance computer of the day. So there's other dots below the curve, but that's the frontier of human computational power. It's held true for 110 years. I'm actually curious, how many people have seen this, either this or a version like this? So a 100-year version of Moore's Law? Good. Oh wait, okay, some latent hands. That is the highest response rate I've ever seen. I show this slide in every talk I give, no matter what the topic. I always ask the question, and I don't think I've ever seen more than 20%, which I'm glad, so I won't belabor it. All I'll say is two takeaways. Exogenous to the economy, right? World War I, World War II, Great Depression, no impact. Um, begs a lot of questions. You know, why does this happen? Um, what happens if it keeps going? But I won't get into that today. I'll just say humanity's capacity to compute has been compounding. That's the one investment theme you can count on for the next 10 years. Now, how could it get really more interesting. You just heard Pete say that uh, they are very interested in quantum computing and want to have one of the first ones on the planet. Um, this is a weird left turn. This guy, Jordy Rose, and, and his first computer they shipped to Lockheed Martin, um, has built the superconducting quantum computers. These have little niobium rings that are entangled with their neighbors, and they do computation in a fundamentally different way. One of the more explanatory theories for how it works is that it engages parallel universes and literally engages the computational resources beyond our own universe. Now, that's pretty weird, um, pretty interesting. It certainly is different. And the only thing that matters, again, to customers is does it outperform my typical computer? Otherwise, why do I care unless I'm into research? And that's where we're just at the cusp in the next year or two of seeing that crossing. And, and it'll either happen or it won't. And if it does, this could be one of those game changers where that Moore's Law starts to look flat compared to what this can do in certain contexts. Let me, let me show you what I mean by that. Here we have a similar exponential curve. You can see the axis. But, but rather than thinking of it like Moore's Law, where this is the, the power of the computer is correlated to the number of qubits, the power of the computer grows itself exponentially with the number of qubits. So if you, you know, add a few, it could double the power of the computer, not just you know, 10, 20, 30% improvement. Um, and it gets pretty darn interesting, because right now we're just at the cusp where Google, for example, has done some work showing that in image recognition and machine learning, it outperforms their data center. And by the way, the caveats in the bottom right corner, this only applies currently to discrete optimization problems, which is like traveling salesman problems, um, that deeply uh, entangled in everything going on with machine learning, which is pretty much everything Google does in their advanced research projects. It applies to Monte Carlo simulations, molecular modeling, a whole bunch of scientific computing stuff. But it's not gonna help Microsoft products, just for example. It's not going to help Word or anything run better. It's, it's, it's the hard science stuff, OK? So anyway, um, next year, we should you know, be as powerful as the best supercomputer. But the, here's the scaling thing. Just give it another year and a half. It's faster than all computers on Earth combined for these particular tasks. And then give it another year and a half, it outperforms the universe. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> if you took all matter of the universe and built it into the optimal design that Intel could ever come up with for a classic computer, and you gave it the entire length of the universe to ca calculate, it would never solve the problem. Whereas it could, this could, in polynomial time, which is mind-bending, right? So it's like, wow, that's kind of like back to David Deutsch's you know, original observation when he theorized these things were possible, is that they should uh, up from everything else. So I'm gonna go to Q&A by skipping over everything else here. There's accelerating change in a lot of other markets, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go over it other than this one thing. I think this is an interesting framework, because it does tie it, and this will be my concluding thoughts. Um, why might Moore's law be like we see it? So already Gordon Moore was observing something that wasn't the original phenomenon, right? Gordon Moore, the Intel engineer, was thinking about a manufacturing optimization calculation deep in the bowels of Intel. He wasn't actually thinking even about computers, right? Or PCs. He's like, what is the fab yield optimization? Very specific to integrated circuits, and he noticed this pattern. It was a refraction of the much bigger trend. What he was seeing in his analysis was, in fact, a derivative point of the big Uber trend over 100 years you know, mechanical computers, vacuum tubes, integrated circuits, discrete transistors, mechanical calculators, they're all on the same curve and no one knew they were on it, right? Not until recently. No one knew they even were on the curve. They were ignorant to it. Um, what it's generally saying is our capacity to compute and, our, and technology itself is accelerating dramatically. The pace of invention is dramatically accelerating. Why is this? Well, there's some interesting books. The summary is all new ideas are, are combinations of prior ideas. Every major invention, radio, electric light bulb, occurred multiple places, usually within months of each other. That is as if the idea was ripe. 
all the predecessors, the electrodynamic theories or electromagnetic theories, whatever it might be, this would be the time for X, Y, or Z. And it occurs simultaneously across the planet. Which means as an entrepreneur, don't assume you're the only one with a good idea. If it's a good idea, probably it's happening uh, quickly uh, by others. But it's these idea pairings. If you think about if every good idea, if every new patent is a combination of other ideas, the pool of possible pairings is growing exponentially. It's a combinatorial explosion. There's a thing called Reed's Law, that if you have like five objects in a set, and you say how many possible subsets can be formed, then you add to six, so you scale from five to six to seven. The number of possible sets grows this two to the n. It's, it's the most powerful, I mean, it just wildly outweighs, let's say, network effects or any of these other, you know, really cool nonlinear things you might hear about. So what I love is Ridley's summary there on the bottom line is that ideas are combining like never before. You have the internet, right? connecting people globally like never before. You have in the next 10 years, four billion additional minds coming online, as Peter Demandis wrote, um, who aren't currently connected to that global conversation. You have, it explains the power of urbanization, why the average person living in a city is more inventive than that same person not living in a city, because they can combine ideas between peoples. It explains when you have separations of populations, like when the Iron Curtain was up with Russia, and then it falls, you have interdisciplinary ideas that are powerful, cross-pollinating like never before, or in academic settings, why it's the interdisciplinary ideas that are so much more powerful than others. It explains the power of globalization, why we have an economy, and why we have accelerating technological change. So I think, I think that's kind of cool. I won't go through that, I won't go through that. Maybe I'll just end with this for Q&A. Um, uh, there are many industries that change because of Moore's Law. Uh, the way you build a rocket using modular reuse from the software industry, the way you build and test these rockets so they fly, let's say, well the first time, or like the Tesla sedan, have it pass crash testing the first time by simulation, uh, not by actually crashing cars. Um, the way mic microbes are being re-engineered to make fuels, chemicals, and food um, like never before. It, Moore's law, as it gets better and better, percolates into new industries, and everything becomes an information technology business. Right? Healthcare is in the middle of that. Healthcare is long away. The biotech is happening as we speak. Right? So biotech is becoming an information science where we can write the code of life like a poem or a computer program. And you don't have to actually physically cut and paste DNA anymore. That's already been shown and, and it has great effect at the pace of progress. So what happens is something that was a trial and error experimentation lab science becomes an information science people can simulate and just run like crazy on the pace of innovation. And so what happens is an industry that had been shielded from disruptive innovation, like fuels and chemicals, like agriculture, like, well, maybe space itself, sees a sudden change when Moore's Law reaches a certain threshold and something that hadn't been doable before in a computational domain suddenly becomes doable. So that's why I'm incredibly hopeful that not only is the future continue to improve because that's, you know, progress is synonymous with change, right? Stasis, the opposite. Um, the pace of that is accelerating geometrically, and so that, will hopefully be a truism every year, right? Five years from now, there'll be even more accelerating change, less predictability in financial markets, more black swan events, more disruption, which is not so good for incumbents. Average life of a company and country will be shorter, but better for humanity. So let me end it with that if we have time for questions. So one question. Yeah, thanks. Most important. Let me ask uh, two questions because I may not sorry. be able to answer this one. Go ahead. Uh, what do you see yeah. as SpaceX most important disruptive innovation? Obviously, they have mm -hmm. good software, but um, so does NASA, so does Boeing, so does Rocketdyne. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot. So um, I think the main one is cultural. Uh, there was a Russian delegation there when we were uh, doing the birthing, and they just asked the same question in 14 different flavors. They could not understand how the culture was built. Why is it that people are smiling? They haven't been sleeping. Why is it that like, they say hi to the CEO when he walks down the hall? They just could not get their head around it. And part of that's structural. Smaller teams tend to outperform bigger teams in every innovative endeavor. Um, so that, I think I would start with that, people. Um, being a galvanizing lightning rod to attract people, it, it, can, it can work for Apple, it can work for a number of firms. And it's more process learning. How do you manage internally than product? So at the end of his life, Steve Jobs observed that what he was most proud of is the thing he built that was Apple. How did he think about a design room where how often we meet, who will be in the meeting, kick people out who aren't supposed to be there, keep team sizes small. Um, have a process of innovation, not like, oh, it's because they chose product A over product B. Um, more specifically, how does that actually percolate in the case of SpaceX? There's a lot of things. I mentioned some modular reuse. So test the Falcon 1, get that Merlin 1 motor working. If it works, don't build a bigger one. Put nine of them on a Falcon 9. 
you know that motor to In fact, with nine of them, you can have engine out. And even if you had one fail, it's still going to be fine. Right? Then you have the Falcon 9. That starts to work. Don't build a big thing. Just strap on you know, two additional side boosters. Now have 27 motors. So it's almost like rendezvous with ROM. Everything's powers of three here. Um, you, you have you know, this, all this reuse. Or the FPGA clusters. Almost all of the control electronics are similar modules, different software. A whole object-oriented uh, software framework on top of it. It's different from, in fact, that's one of the major sources of the delays in the last launch was the testing protocols were somewhat new to NASA and everyone else involved for this new programming me methodology. And, and, and you know, sorry, the old rules still reside, which is you've got to test everything, even if it's, even if it's modular. Um, so there's a lot of things like that, but I would really de-emphasize all the back half of that question and say, at least in my personal opinion, um, you know, an entrepreneurial endeavor uh, with uh, entrepreneurial mindset uh, and stock options and you know, folks working like they're in a startup is, you know, you know, regardless of industry, a team of seven people working on something, or less ideally, is gonna outperform a team of 1,000 on a task, on a single task. And, and if you have 1,000 people, you really wanna partition it to get a lot of things done, not work on one thing. Is that it? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Steve.